The Wehrmacht during the Second World War sustained two times the deaths of the Imperial German Army in the First World War. Yet it did not collapse. Quite on the contrary, it fought until the bitter end. In 1918, in the face of a lost war, the German sailors did not want to leave again in 1918 for the honor of arms of the Navy and the naval idea. The German soldiers of 1944 were to take the offensive several more times. Most recently on a large scale for a Wacht am Rhein, the Ardennes offensive. And were they no longer attacked, they defended until the end. Additionally, the Western Allies two times assumed that the Wehrmacht would collapse, yet it did not. The question is, why did the Wehrmacht not collapse? Before we look at the various factors, we need to get a better understanding of the severity of the losses sustained in summer 1944 by the German forces on both the Eastern and Western Front in a short amount of time. From June to August 1944, the Germans suffered two major defeats. The better known is the Battle of Normandy in the West. The lesser known but more important was Operation Bagraton on the Eastern Front, which led to the destruction of Heeresgruppe Mitte. On the Eastern Front, the Germans had about 589,000 deaths in that period. Whereas on all other fronts combined, including the Normandy, German losses were around 157,000 deaths, according to Obermanns. So a total of 746,000 deaths in just three months. For some of you, those numbers likely make a severe impression, yet for some, they might be less relatable. Probably the best known German defeat in the Second World War was the Battle of Stalingrad. In November 1943, the Sixth Army and parts of the Fourth Panzer Army were encircled and ultimately surrendered in early February 1943. If we take the three months with the highest losses in this period, namely December 1942 to February 1943 for the Eastern Front, we get deaths of about 327,000 men. We are aware that those losses also include non-Stalingrad casualties. Yet the importance here is the overall scale. This means that the Germans suffered in summer 1944 each month on average 76% of the deaths they had sustained during the months of winter 1942-1943 on the Eastern Front. Or in other words, the Germans in summer 1944 suffered almost 2.3 Stalingrads in terms of deaths. Yet even after these major losses, the Germans kept on fighting. At the end of November 1944, General Eisenhower called upon the combined chiefs of staff to examine new methods of deception and propaganda in order to overcome the immense resistance and unbroken morale of the Wehrmacht, else faced with prolonged and bitter fighting. So how did the Wehrmacht maintain its cohesion to survive such major blows? Especially considering that since winter 1942-1943, Germany and the Wehrmacht sustained a large amount of defeats and setbacks like Stalingrad, the loss of the Afrika Corps, sometimes called Tunisgrad, the failed offensive at the Kursk salient, the following Soviet offensive, and the surrender of Italy among various others. For this we look a bit at cohesion and related aspects. There are various definitions of cohesion. I will take the definition from this US Marine Corps paper as a foundation. There are four types of cohesion, horizontal cohesion among peers, vertical cohesion from subordinate to leader, organizational cohesion within an army, and societal cohesion between an army and its society. Cohesive units fight better, suffer fewer casualties, train better, do not disintegrate, require less support, and provide members with a higher quality of life. Cohesion's central requirement is personal stability. In other words, horizontal cohesion is created by shared experiences, both negative and positive. It results in trust among the men. Vertical cohesion is built by leaders understanding, caring and leading the men. As such, subordinates trust their leaders. Organizational cohesion is a bit more abstract. It is about soldiers relating to the military organization, hence stories, symbols, ceremonies, traditions and other overall culture of a military organization are key. If a soldier can identify himself with his force, there is organizational cohesion. Societal cohesion is similar to organizational cohesion, yet on the national level. This is achieved if the soldiers feel that their contributions are valued by society and that the force supports national policy. If you think this is overly complicated, well, here's the simple version. 
Four brave men who do not know each other wrote Adan to pick in his combat studies but hesitate to attack a lion. Four less brave men but knowing and trusting each other will do resolutely. Speaking of four brave men, let us start with the primary groups. These are usually considered to be the squad, platoon and up to company. So in terms of manpower we are speaking about 10 to 200 men. Unlike the US Army in the Second World where the German Army followed a regional organization as such men in one division or even up to an army were usually from the same region. The intention of the Wehrmacht was to keep their, their core groups together and they knew that it is, was positive um, if, if the core groups would contain out of people from the same region, that they have a regional background, the same regional background, a regional identity, spoke the same, the same dialect, etc. And they tried to keep that together. And they recruited only from uh, soldiers to specific units from a regional, from the same regional background. And they tried to, to send wounded soldiers from a given unit back to that very unit to keep the core groups together. Of course, this did not turn out uh, in every case, but more or less, and this um, has, was shown by, by Christopher Russ in his PhD, although the Wehrmacht had um, and suffered very high casualties until yeah, well, autumn 44, they, until autumn 44, the Wehrmacht was able to keep the primary groups, the core groups, more or less intact until autumn 44. After autumn 44, um, this structure on the horizontal level, this, this cohesion on, on the primary group level um, collapsed. But until autumn 44, the primary groups were more or less intact. And so why are they so important? I mean, this is, this is um, recognized, I think, by all sociologists um, also working on other um, armed forces. Um, so the core groups or primary groups, as we would say in German, are somehow a social retreat, a compensation for the family, a place where there is sociability and a very close interaction of people of, say, possibly a dozen, from a dozen to, to a company level. This is then referred as a core group. Very, very important. Comradeship is, is you know, it is the life for comradeship, the, the place for comradeship. And the interesting thing is how important in these core groups, primary groups, was politics or ideology, Nazi ideology. And sometimes we think, this was the, the argument from Omar Batov, of, of, of the Wehrmacht driven by NS and Nazi ideology. And, and I think it's very clear that the currency of these core groups was not ideology or politics. And this is possibly true, uh, not only for the Wehrmacht, but for, I don't know, all armies uh, in the 20th century. The, the currency of the core groups and this was shown by bugged conversations of German prisoners in the Second World War, um, secretly bugged um, conversations, was sympathy, the role of a given person in this core group, and military competence. It's very much military competence. If somebody was a brave soldier, a competent soldier, who won medals, etc., he had a uh, he was, you know, renowned in a very positive way. And this was the military competence, sympathy, of course, personal sympathy, the role in social group. This was, you know, um, very important for the cohesion of the core groups. And on the other hand, this, this, it's then clear if people doesn't like each other or if members of the core groups were incompetent in the military sense, the core groups would become dysfunctional. Generally, the primary groups are considered essential by many for the durability of the Wehrmacht in the Second World War. This goes in line with the Allied military intelligence observation during the war as well. Allied military intelligence had already concluded before the end of the war that it was not the higher segments of the German officer corps, but the German enlisted ranks and group leaders who showed higher morale in this war. The readiness to fight was still high among the simple soldiers of the Wehrmacht at the time when the certainty of defeat had long since entered the military elite. Which brings us to the next level, vertical cohesion, the trust of the soldiers in their superiors. For the Wehrmacht the system worked from the data we know. Some of it is based on German soldiers in US POW camps that were questioned. 75% of the soldiers were satisfied, 
how they were treated by their superiors. More than 60% of the officers received a good rating. For the NCOs, this rating was even above 75%. The general guideline was that the superior had to use both care and discipline for his men. Although during the war, the discipline was mostly focused on combat discipline. Other elements like taking care of the uniform and military greetings were given a bit more slack. One new officer noted that one company commander used his dagger during a meeting to clean his fingernails. He was not amused by this performance of personal hygiene in a formal setting. In overall, pragmatism seems to have dominated over discipline, as Professor Neitzel explains. Um, sometimes we, we think the Wehrmacht you know, was an armed forces where bullying was widespread and, and we sometimes see this in films, etc. And I think the Wehrmacht developed itself in, uh, very much in the same way as, as a lot of other armed forces, Western armies in particular, that at the front line, formal discipline became less important. And it's not comparable to what happened on a barrack yard. So I think this was formal discipline, very important in training, but not at the front line. And I think in the case of the Wehrmacht that the normal, the average soldier, they trusted their officers because these officers were not bullying them, more or less. Of course, there were cases of bullying, but overall. And there were the same rules for all soldiers in the trenches and at the front line. There was no exceptions in terms of food and going on leave, etc. It was the same rules for everyone. And we know that in the First World War, there was hate on German officers being in the rear areas, in the headquarters, etc., and having, having a nice life and not sharing the dangers of the front line with the soldiers. This did not happen in the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht was very successful in constructing a, yeah, a social cohesion and saying oh, we all share the same destiny, more or less. And there's no difference between, or no big difference between the officers and men. So there was really a very strong, uh, yeah, um, I mean, you could say a band of brothers uh, to a degree, in the, in the best way, in the Wehrmacht. And this is one of the reasons why this vertical cohesion was in, the, was in the Wehrmacht so strong. Something that is often mentioned about German commanders is that they led from the front. As such, they were with their men in combat but also in death, as the statistics suggest. Neitzel points out that from the 3,191 Wehrmacht generals, 849 were killed in action, died as prisoners, or committed suicide. This meant that the chance to die as a German general was 27%, whereas for all other German soldiers this was 34%. Grefer looked at the casualty rates of German officers and noted the following. Early in the war, therefore, an officer's chance of getting himself killed was twice as good as that of all military personnel. By 1944, since the proportion of officers in the army as a whole had fallen to just under 2.5%, it still stood at over 150%. This relative predominance of officers among the dead holds true for every single campaign that could be examined, and also for individual units. In short, this suggests that the German commanders generally did not ask for something they would not do themselves. At least when it came to dying, there seems to be little doubt about it. A key element for organizational cohesion, which is soldiers relating to the military organization, were the different Waffengattungen, the different arms of service. The Wehrmacht was able to create a strong identity among its different arms quickly and successfully. They distinguished themselves by different uniforms like the Panzertruppe, songs and rituals. In contrast to the Imperial German Army in the First World War, the Wehrmacht focused more on creating various elite formations, like the motorized divisions, yet also Panzer divisions, Fajimjäger and Gebirgsjäger, the mountain units. According to Neitzel, these various arms are a fundamental element in stabilizing the system. Another aspect is of course propaganda and indoctrination. Yet these factors are quite tricky. Some authors consider them more important than others. Additionally, it is not so straightforward, although the Wehrmacht and especially its higher leadership was highly complicit with the National Socialist regime, it was also not some monolithic block, as pointed out by Professor Neitzel. So one of the secrets of the Wehrmacht was that it, in this you know, social unit, it was possible to integrate 17 million men. And these 17 million men 
came from a huge variety of social and political backgrounds. You have former communists, social democrats, ardent Nazis, totally unpolitical people, all acting and doing their job in the Wehrmacht. And so for the Wehrmacht it was a, a, an advantage that they did not become a, a second Waffen-SS, that in the normal social life politics did not play a major role and they were able to integrate almost everyone into this, this armed forces. And even it's interesting because we even have in the Wehrmacht people uh, from a non-German background. We have Poles, we have French people, Dutch people, etc, etc, etc. And all these people were integrated into an armed forces and just more or less try to do their job in a military way. So the, re the most important, important currency of the Wehrmacht was military competence. And if you are competent, um, people recognize you in, in a very positive way. And it was not far and foremost politics. And by this, you know, so to say, unpolitical currency, it was able to integrate even the former communists. They were not gone, they were still there. But, and sometimes even they, of course, they disliked the Nazi regime. But oddly enough, they perceived the Wehrmacht and the Nazi regime as something different two sides of the medal, but two different sides of the medal. And they could be loyal to the Wehrmacht as a military institution, but of course disloyal to the Nazi regime. And this is one of the secret weapons, I would call it, of the Wehrmacht, that they were really be able to, to being perceived as a competent organization to whom one is loyal in a military sense. Furthermore, soldiers that believed in propaganda might have done this in some cases out of necessity. Of 50 Wehrmacht soldiers questioned who had been captured by the Allies in the battles near Naples in September 1943, a good half believed in an imminent counter-strike. The absence of the Luftwaffe, the lack of ammunition and the transport problems experienced recently were all indications that an immense German reserve had been formed, which once thrown into battle would force the Allies out of Europe. German propaganda achieved over time that the Allied leaflets and other measures were more distrusted and was able to paint the picture of a post-war situation that made Versailles look like a sweet deal. Additionally, the situation that there was not really an alternative might have increased the effectiveness of propaganda itself, especially since most soldiers were aware of the various atrocities committed by Germany in one way or another. As noted, a key element in both horizontal and vertical cohesion was trust. Trust can be built in various ways. One among them is to have a system that is or at least seems fair. One key aspect here is that the recognition had to be earned. It was not handed out for free. Political background mattered little, what counted was military competence. This was expressed by a complex system of awards, cuff bands and decorations. And unlike the previous wars, there were no preferences for officers. This is reflected by the number of awarded Knights Crosses in World War II in contrast to the Prussian Poole Marites in World War I. The majority of Knights Cross recipients were troop officers, not staff officers and generals. Although there was a strong focus on sacrifice and Todesverachtung, literally meaning contempt for death, in both nationalist socialist ideology, military orders and military publications, for instance, the company commander is the bearer of the fighting spirit of his men. He pulls his company forward in the attack. He trains, educates for duty and inspires daring and contempt for death. Awards like the Knight's Cross were generally not awarded for blind fanatism. This becomes apparent if one looks at the numbers. In the official language of the Nazi regime, of course, the sacrifice uh, was very important. And you might, and of course, there were numbers of speeches from Hitler saying you, you, you have to sacrifice yourself, you have to fight to the last bullet and you have to die on the battlefield, blah, 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 more or less. Interestingly, if you look at, at um, the Night Cross and the Night Cross holders, it's interesting that only 7% uh, of the Night Crosses were awarded post whom. So 93% of those soldiers who won the Night Cross did survive, at least the awards, they did survive the awards. So they were not these people of, of fanatic soldiers who tried to blow themselves up with an enemy tank or so. Sometimes you see this on paintings, for example in Volgograd, 
in, in the Second World War Museum there, there is on paintings where Soviet soldiers blow up a German tank and of course will be killed. This is not the view, the German view, of what a soldier should do. So, and you could see this with, with, the, with the Night Crosses. So, the Night Cross was a currency of success, of tactical success. They should be successful on the battlefield. And just blowing yourself up with a tank is, is on a larger scale not a success. So, and therefore, again, it's interesting that the Night Cross was not awarded primarily by ideological or political criteria, but after genuine military criteria. And therefore, you must survive. You must fight on. And you must have success on the battlefield. And that's the major currency. So that's interesting. And so in comparison to, to other awards, like the Victoria Cross, for example, the, the amount of of awards post whom is much lower in the case of the, of the Night Cross. It should be added here that generally there seems to be the misconception that the highest military awards are often awarded posthumously. At least for the Knight's Cross and the US Medal of Honor, this seems to be very wrong to quote from the homepage of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. Overall, only 18.5% of Medals of Honor have been awarded posthumously. Note, this number is an overall and not limited to the Second World War. But back to the Wehrmacht. It is crucial to note that the influence of these factors would diminish over time. Since fall 1943 there was a clear downward trend. About the same time the Nationalist Socialist Leadership Officer was introduced. Although the summer of 1944 did not lead to the collapse of the Wehrmacht, and Eisenhower mentioned the resistance of the Wehrmacht even in winter 1944, Neitzel notes a downward trend no later than August 1944. Particularly for 1945, there were various examples when German soldiers still defended, yet the willingness to attack was severely diminished. As a reaction, in 1945, the number of death sentences and kangaroo courts increased dramatically. As with some previous points, we make a comparison to the Imperial German Army of the First World War, yet unlike the previous examples, this time the Wehrmacht had a far worse track record. In World War I, only 150 death sentences were issued and only 48 of those were executed. In contrast, from 1939 until the end of 1944, the Wehrmacht executed 9,732 death sentences alone. It is assumed that in total around 15 to 20,000 were executed until May 1945, which also clearly shows that the majority of these happened in the last months of the war. To conclude, the Wehrmacht, albeit numerous major defeats throughout the war, did not collapse. It was able to maintain its cohesion for the most part. This was due to the ability to maintain a stability in its smaller units, which served as primary groups and the home of the soldiers. Another aspect was that the generals, officers and especially NCOs were perceived as competent. Similarly, the casualty rates of officers were higher than those of regular soldiers. Whereas even generals had a significant death ratio, namely a chance of being killed of 27% compared to 34% of the overall soldier. The different arms in the Wehrmacht, with a complicated system of uniform and badges, allowed in combination with rituals and other measures to create an identity that bound the men to their respective arms, but on a larger level also to the Wehrmacht. Propaganda and indoctrination also played a part, although its importance might be overstated at times. Probably more important was the rather rigorous military justice system. Whereas in World War I less than 50 men were executed, the Wehrmacht until December 1944 alone executed more than 9,000 men. In total, it is estimated that between 15 and 20,000 were executed until the surrender in May 1945. Big thank you here to Professor Neitzel for the interview and providing me with early access to his book. Thank you to Flo and Tony for providing close support from the forward operating base in Berlin. Special thanks to my Patreon and subscriber supporters. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.